Welcome everyone. I am going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I have a couple minutes after seven. Uh, I know there were about 70 people, as I said, signed up for this and we've got about 40-ish online. Um, so some people may join as we go forward. Um, hopefully you all saw the intro here. Um, just a couple housekeeping kinds of things. Um, I am Christy Morley. I'm the senior naturalist here at Wizzick and Trails. And um, also on the video with us is Margaret Rohde, our conservation manager, and she's going to help um, do a little bit of moderating for us and keep an eye on the chat box for questions. And, and I will stop, <clears throat> excuse me, several times um, throughout the presentation for questions. I am going to ask everybody to keep their microphones muted. Um, you came into the video that way. And if you're on the phone, please mute your phone as well. Um, with this many people on the phones or video, we would get a lot of feedback. Um, and it's just hard to keep everybody in, you know, from talking at one time. So Margaret's going to help uh, moderate the questions. You can type questions into the chat box if you have them, and I will stop several times um, throughout. There will be a recording of this available online afterwards that you will be able to go back and see. And I will also send out um, a PDF of the slides. Um, so that you'll have the links um, that I'm going to show you this evening. So with that, um, we're going to jump into learning bird song. As I said, um, for anybody that joined a little bit later, my name is Christy Morley, and I am the senior naturalist here at Wissahick and Trails. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn the videos off. Um, so tonight, I. I want to talk a little bit real quick um, about who we are. We have a lot of people on the line and a, a whole bunch of names I didn't recognize. So I just want to take a second um, to let everybody know who might not be familiar with us. We are uh, an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We were founded in 1957 um, to protect the land and waterways of the Wisthicken Creek and the Wisthicken Valley. And we have protected about 1,300 acres of land. Um, that we've saved from development. And on that land, we manage 12 nature preserves and 24 miles of trails that are open to the public. If you are already a supporter of our organization, thank you very much. We very much depend on our supporters to help us continue our mission. And if you're not a supporter of our organization, I invite you to go online to our website, um, check us out in a little bit more detail and, and please um, support our work um, moving forward. Also a quick announcement about um, a couple of upcoming programs that we have. Um, this coming Monday, I will be doing a program on monarch butterflies and talking um, pretty in depth about their life cycle and talking about some citizen science projects that you can actually do right now from the comfort of your own backyard. Um, so I invite you to go on our website and sign up for that. And then on Wednesday, um, which is a great follow on for this, um, Cindy Nuss is going to be presenting for us. She's um, part of the Wincote Audubon Society, um, choosing pollinator plants for your garden. So it goes hand in hand with the idea of monarch butterflies and other pollinators. So again, on our website, you can um, sign up for those programs and they'll both be um, Zoom webinars just like this one is. So Real quick, I wanted to go over the outline of my plan for tonight. Um, first and foremost, I'm gonna uh, let you know the magic secret of learning birdsong. So we'll just start right from there. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the physiology of bird songs and songs versus calls and all of those kinds of things. And then um, how do we identify bird sounds? Um, some mnemonics and learning about mnemonics and how they might help us learn bird songs. Um, additional learning tools and resources, and then a little bit on putting it all together. And as I said, I will stop for questions. Um, um, please um, put your questions in the chat, chat box. Um, keep yourself muted, keep your phone muted, and we will, um, Margaret will help us uh, coordinate the questions when we get to that point. So, is everybody ready to learn the magic secret of learning bird song? Hold on to your seats. Go outside, listen to birds, and repeat often. 
In other words, there really is no magic secret. And I know a lot of people probably got onto this webinar thinking, oh, I'm gonna finally learn how to identify bird songs. And I really do hope that you come away with some tools um, that will help you do that. There are a lot of different things that can help assist your learning. But, and we're gonna talk about almost all of these tonight. But the reality of it is, is that to truly learn bird song, you need to spend as much time outside with the birds as possible. Like any skill, the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. One thing that can really help you is to try to see the bird that's singing. So combine your physical identification of a bird with paying attention to the sounds that they're making when you see them, if they're making any sounds. And don't overwhelm yourself. Learn the common birds first and learn them really well because if you get a good handle on that, and we're gonna talk more about that later on, but if you get a good handle on that, that can help you sort of filter out the things that you hear all the time so that you can then learn new bird songs um, when you're in the field or recognize that something different is singing and cue your ear to that. And this actually isn't really as hard as it sounds. Um, you know, most of us can probably pick out our parents' voice or a spouse's voice or our child's voice out of a crowd. Uh, a lot of us can probably actually recognize um, an actor that's doing the voice of an animated character in a movie. And we know immediately who that actor is because we recognize their voice. And learning bird song is exactly the same as that. It's practice, it's repetition, it's hearing those birds over and over and over again. Um, and basically imprinting them in our brain just like we imprint our significant other's voice or our child's voice or an actor in a movie. So the physiology of bird song is actually kind of complicated and complex and we're going to sort of simplify it here. Um, but the picture on the right here is actually a picture of a bird sound box and they use what's called a syrinx. We have a larynx but similar principle. We breathe air in, we push air out, and as the air flows across the muscles in the bird's syrinx or our larynx, we make sound. Um, different species of birds have different numbers of muscles that control their syrinx. So birds with very simple songs, like gulls, for example, um, they only really have one set of muscles that controls their syrinx. Birds like cardinals or a wood thrush, um, song sparrows, they have five to seven pairs of muscles that control their syrinx. So that allows them to create much more complex sounds. In addition, birds that have a lot of sets of muscles like that can control each of these bronchial tubes down here um, separately. And so that allows them to basically sing in duet with themselves. And this is what makes it so hard for us as human beings to try to recreate what a bird sounds like when we're trying to explain it to somebody or thinking back on, on ourselves. Is that really what it sounds like? Because we physically cannot make the sounds that birds can make. Um, so we can whistle and we can make some of those sounds and replicate a few parts of it, but it is actually physically impossible for us to replicate those sounds. And so that's also part of what makes it hard for us to learn and remember. But it does explain why it is, why bird sounds are as complex as they are. Um, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more um, as we move forward, but just keep that in mind, that that complexity literally is the physical representation of, of how they move air um, over their sound box. There's two ways that birds learn songs, and you don't have to worry about the names, it just holds the categories in place, but the, this first group of birds actually has to learn their song from a father or a neighbor, and those songs tend to be more complex. Um, in addition, things that make it more difficult for us when we're trying to learn songs is birds in this category sometimes can sing multiple song types. Mostly they sing a primary song type, but they might have a few alternate songs that they sing. And 
you will become more familiar with that again, the more time you spend out in the field with birds and you'll start to recognize some of those variations. But for the most part tonight, we're gonna talk about the primary songs that most species sing, um, but know that there might be some variation in the field. And despite the fact that some of these songs can be complex, not all of them actually produce beautiful songs and not all of them are actually complex. And we'll have a few examples of that as we move forward. The other category of birds are genetically hardwired with their songs, and they tend to be simpler songs. So like our flycatchers, if you've ever heard the Phoebe, Eastern Phoebe in the woods, it literally says its name, Phoebe, 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 and that's it. Um, or the Peewee says its name, and so it's a much simpler song than a cardinal or a robin even, for example. And the non-passerine kinds of birds like hawks and ducks and shorebirds also fall into this genetically hardwired category. So their songs tend to be simple as well. So it's this first group of what we consider the songbirds that are probably the really difficult ones to learn. All of the warblers that come through our area in the spring, they all fall into this um, songbird category with their mostly complex songs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about songs versus calls. Songs tend to be complex, as I said, learned. Um, they are given principally by a male to defend a territory or attract a mate. And so singing of bird song is largely driven by changes that occur in preparation for breeding. And it is actually a physiological thing um, that why we have more bird song in the spring, because the increase in daylight actually leads to an increase in testosterone in the males. It increases the size of the brain that controls song. And so they sing more. And because they need to defend a territory and attract a mate. In the winter, when they don't necessarily need to defend a territory or attract a mate, they tend to sing much less. That part of their brain actually decreases in size. Um, they don't need to spend energy on those things. So they don't need to keep um, that size of their brain you know, functioning on that. They're more interested in finding food and staying warm. And so those are the things that take over. So this is why we get this massive upswing of bird song in the spring and why it tapers off by the end of the summer because they're done breeding. And mostly it's the males that sing, but not always. Um, there are a number of female birds that sing. Cardinals are actually one of those. You can often see female cardinals singing um, as well. Um, they're probably the one of the more common ones in our area, but in the tropics, there's actually a lot of female birds that sing. And this is something that researchers are now um, actually devoting a lot more attention to because they have realized that there are a fair number of female birds that actually do sing almost as much as the males do in some areas. So I'm going to give you the first example of, so um, one comment that I'm going to make. Helping you learn bird song, the best thing that you can do is how whatever method you're using is try to make sure that you can see a picture of the bird. So if you're doing something in your own house with a field guide, make sure you're looking at the bird that's singing, that you're practicing listening to their song. If you're in the field, again, like I said, trying to find the bird that's singing will really help you memorize that song and get it in your brain. Just hearing the songs can help you put the songs in your brain, but it won't help you connect them to a bird. So just keep that in mind. So for all the bird song examples that I'm gonna play for you tonight, I have a picture of the bird on the screen so that you can see it um, for exactly that reason. So this is a male Northern Cardinal, and this is its song. I'm gonna play it one more time. So. Yeah. 
So you can hear a couple of different parts to that song, a few changes in pitch. We're going to talk more about that as we move forward. That's a fairly complex song. It's not outrageously complex compared to some, but that is not the case. There are definitely exceptions to songs um, in terms of complexity. So this little bird here is the Acadian flycatcher. And this is the entirety of its song. That's it. So even though most songs tend to be more complex, um, some are actually very simple. And again, not necessarily a beautiful song, um, but definitely necessary to tell the Acadian flycatcher from all of the other small yellowish green flycatchers uh, that might be in the area. Its voice is very important, even though it's not a dramatic song. Calls, on the other hand, are simple. Um, these are innate um, in the birds. They don't have to learn these. They're used by both sexes. Um, in more general context. So they can be used to raise an alarm call if a predator is in the area. Um, they can be used as a contact call to maintain contact with a mate or a flock. Um, begging calls given by chicks, if you've ever been around a nest that has small nestlings in it, you can hear their very high pitched begging sounds. Um, and then there's also another category that I didn't put on here, I need to change that, is um, flight calls. So a lot of birds actually when they're migrating um, overhead in the dark, in the fall, in the spring, you can actually hear them. Um, they give flight calls. These are actually identifiable flight calls in a lot of cases if you know what you're listening for. Um, this is an area that I personally have not spent a lot of time with. Um, it is hard enough to learn all of the songs of the birds that I can actually see. Um, to see, to learn the songs of the birds flying overhead in the dark is that are giving tiny little call notes is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, but know that it is possible to actually do that. And that is sort of the next level of bird song identification or bird call identification. I'm going to suggest that most of us focus here on identifying the basic songs of a lot of the birds. And for the birds that we have that are much more common in our areas, like the Northern Cardinal, that we also start to learn their contact notes or their call notes, because that will help us during the time that they're not actively singing. So in the winter, for example, they will still give these call notes. So this is the call note of the Northern Cardinal. Whoops. Try that again. This is often um, described as a metallic chip note, if you will. So I'm going to play it one more time. And if you've spent any time outside birding in our area locally, you have probably heard this, even if you didn't know what it is. This is a very common um, call in, in our area. They're a relatively common bird um, and likewise their songs are very common in the spring as well. There's another category of sounds that can also help us identify birds, uh, but they're non-vocal sounds. So things like woodpeckers beating their bill against a hard surface. Um, sometimes you can actually tell the species of woodpeckers apart depending on how they're beating. Um, not always, but sometimes. A lot of bills will actually, a lot of birds will actually do bill snapping very actively. So they are really opening and closing and making really loud snapping sounds with their bills. Um, starlings, grackles, other kinds of blackbirds will do this a lot. Um, if you've ever heard a morning dove or a pigeon take off, you know that they make a lot of noise. And that's actually the wings are kind of clapping together over their back as they fly away. Um, and that's, you know, another non-vocal sound that can help us either cue into that there's a bird in the area um, or sometimes just know, oh, that was a morning dove or that was a group of pigeons taking off. 
Likewise, some birds move feathers through their air. So this is a rough grouse down here, this last bottom picture. Um, and rough grouse males don't actually sing. They sit up on a log and they beat their wings in a way that sort of makes this thrumming, drumming sound um, that is entirely from them moving their feathers through the air. I wanted to have an example of it, but it's actually a very um, low frequency sound and it doesn't carry over computer speakers very well. So I would urge you to go, if you've never heard one, um, go listen to a bird song and I'll have resources how to find those later, but listen to the song or the call of the rough grouse um, and, and hear that and know that it's just their feathers. And likewise, there's a, a number of other grouse-like birds that actually um, inflate their body cavities with air and use that as their um, breeding call, if you will. Um, but there's no actual vocal sound coming out. So um, another interesting way of attracting a mate. And these birds tend to be in areas like the ones that inflate their body cavities um, on prairie grasslands and things like that. And so that low frequency sound actually carries very far across that landscape. And so it works better than a bird a singing might actually work for them. So I'm gonna stop here for questions. Um, Margaret, you should be able to unmute yourself. So you can like relay questions out loud to me if there are any questions so far. I think we're good so far. There's nothing in the chat that we can address right now. Like there's no bird question. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions as we move forward, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will stop again and we'll go from there. So I'm going to move into and I, I classify this as identifying bird sounds. Um, this is kind of the meat of what are we actually listening for um, when we're out in the field and when we're trying to figure out what is singing and how to get a handle on that. So I have some examples here that I'm, I'm going to go through um, and I've picked these as kind of representative things. There's about 20 different birds that I could have picked for each one of these. I tried generally to pick birds that are in our area um, and things that you might be familiar with already a little bit so that you know it can sort of cement that idea in your head. Um, but the kinds of things that we're actually listening for when we are listening to bird songs are things like pitch. So is it high or low? And that can be relative to the other things around it as well, especially if we don't know what's singing. Um, so I'm gonna play, this is um, a tufted titmouse. And then this is a common raven. So you can hear the tufted titmouse, while this is not an incredibly high pitched song, has a much higher pitch than the raven does. Um, for the most part, birds' sense of hearing and range of hearing is the same as our own as humans, so we can pretty much hear the full range of sounds that they make. Unlike, say, for example, bats that are in the ultrasonic range that we can't really hear the sounds that they're making a lot of times. Um, so we can hear bird songs. Now, there are a few that are incredibly high pitched songs that as we age, high pitch is the sound we lose first. And so for the most part, there are a few that as we age get harder to hear. Um, things like black pole warblers and sometimes cedar wax wings, they tend to have very high pitched songs. But for the most part, we can hear the range of sounds that birds make and we can generally categorize them 
into a high or low or a moderate pitch. The other thing that we can pay attention to is the tempo of the song. Is it fast or slow? And in this case, sometimes what can be helpful is to think about it, can I count the notes? So if we play the American Goldfinch song, which is down here in the bottom right corner. Play it again. It's kind of fast, but generally speaking, you could probably count the notes in that song as compared to the house finch, which is over here on the left. This bird starts out relatively slow, and I will play it again here in a second, but then it, it moves into this much more rapid, faster paced jumble of notes that become much more difficult to count than the goldfinch example. So I'll play this one more time. The other thing that can be important when you're thinking about tempo is does the song speed up or slow down? And those are the, these are the kinds of things that if you don't know what you're listening to, making notes to yourself, rec, you know, pull out your cell phone and open an app that lets you take notes or keep a small notebook in your pocket and being able to start writing down some of these things and describing them will really help you be able to identify the song um, after the fact, or even at the time when then you're looking in the field guide, because you, you know if you're a bird watcher, the bird doesn't always stay where you want it to stay, um, and it might stop singing. And so if you've made some notes on, you know, is it a high pitch or is it a low pitch? Is it fast? Can I count the notes? How many notes are there? Um, does it speed up or slow down? Those kinds of things are the things that we want to pay attention to. And then the other category is how the tone sounds. And this is somewhat subjective, probably the most subjective part of bird song, to be honest with you. But we can generally describe things using these kinds of descriptions. And this is not a comprehensive list. This is just to give you some ideas of the things that we're thinking about. So is the bird whistling? So we would say the titmouse is a whistle. The raven is harsh. Croaky. Um, a wood thrush is often described as flute-like or almost liquid sounding. You'll notice that the wood thrush's song also has a bit of a metallic note to it as well. Um, this is a bird, as I mentioned in the beginning, some birds can actually sing in harmony with themselves. This bird is actually doing that. Um, if you, there are examples online where you, people have slowed the bird's song, this bird's song down to like one quarter speed and you can actually hear the two different parts of the song. So this is why this song sounds so complex. And this is one of those songs that's really difficult for us to have any kind of uh, representation of that we make ourselves. Um, so I'm gonna play this one more time so you can hear it again.
contrast that to the very buzzy sounding blue winged warbler. I always think this song sounds like it's, this bird sounds like it's blowing raspberries. Oh, I'm gonna play this song for you one more time because this is also a good example of having a song that has a couple of different characteristics in it that we've talked about. So it starts out relatively high in pitch and then the pitch actually drops in the second part of the song. Um, so again, it's, it's sort of that characteristic. Um, it does not just fall into one category. There's a few different things that we can um, describe about this song that might help us identify it. I'm gonna play it one more time. And then I'm going to play an example of kind of putting all of this together. Um, and this was really hard because I was trying to find two, two, oh, I'm sorry, repetition is the other thing that we want to be listening for in the field. And I have an entire slide on that because that's a really important thing um, and needs more discussion. So, um, but I want to compare these two birds down here at the bottom of your screen. So this is um, the house finch with its sort of reddish street breast there, and I'll play its song again. And then this is the song sparrow another very common song bird in our area. Both of these birds sing varied songs. They're this mix of whistled notes, um, trills, buzzy sounds, but we notice that the house finch tends to sing at a faster tempo and has more changes in pitch. Play this one again. versus our song sparrow that is a little bit slower, more measured with less changes in pitch. So that's kind of the basics of the things that we're looking for, um, or listening for, I should say, not looking for. Um, and the things that can help us kind of get a handle on a song that we're hearing for the first time or a song that we might not know what bird is singing. Um, I said repetition was important, and we're gonna, we can talk about this in a couple of ways. Repetition can either refer to the notes themselves, like individual notes, or the phrases that a bird sings. So in the case of the song sparrow, you'll notice that it starts its song with three repeated notes and they're pretty close to the same notes. Um, and it repeats each part of the song, each song segment with those three notes. 
So I'm going to play it again for you and see if you can pick out those three notes at the beginning. So that last song is a little bit different. Um, but the first two parts of the song, the first two repetitions of the song, you can hear the, the three notes by themselves um, before it goes into the jumble of everything else. And so those three notes can give us a really good handle on the song sparrow singing because it's kind of the only bird in our area that does that. So once we get familiar with that cue and we hear those three notes, even if the jumble that comes after that is different because each song sparrow can sing a slightly different song, we can still get a good handle on recognizing that that's a song sparrow singing because of that repetition. For some species, the actual, it's hard to explain this, but we'll, you'll hear it when I play it, the, the phrases within their songs repeat. So these three birds are three mimics that we have in our area. Up at the top here is the gray catbird, in the middle is a brown thrasher, and then down here at the bottom is a northern mockingbird. All three of these birds can kind of replicate other birds' songs. Most notably, the um, northern mockingbird can often really sound like another bird, but the, the catbird and the, the um, brown thrasher can also somewhat sound like other birds' songs as well. Part of the key to getting a handle on separating out these three songs in the field and recognizing them is understanding how they repeat. So a catbird doesn't really repeat much throughout its song. You can hear a lot of whininess to it, um, but the song's kind of all over the place. Compare that to a brown thrasher, which tends to repeat each phrase twice. So you can hear that that song sounds much more patterned than the song of the catbird. And the mockingbird tends to repeat phrases three or more times. So learning those patterns, I'm going to play the brown thrasher and the mockingbird again for you because it's easiest to pick out the patterns in those two songs and then know that the great catbird doesn't often have a pattern. So this is the thrasher. and the Mockingbird. So again, paying attention to repetition and, and listening for the repeating elements of a song can be very helpful in identifying them, especially in birds like the thrasher and the catbird, which like to skulk in bushes and don't often like to come out and be seen a lot of times. Um, understanding those patterns or lack thereof in the case of the catbird can be very helpful. 
The next area that I'm going to talk about is mnemonics and phonetics, um, as I like to put it. And a lot of people have probably heard the idea of birdsong mnemonics. Um, mnemonics just means a memory aid. So the things that we used to have in school, like my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas to remember the order of the planets or Roy G. Bibb to remember the order of the colors of the rainbow. Um, and for birdsong, what we're doing is putting phrases or words that really are meant to indicate the song's pattern um, to help us remember the song. This is an area that is, can be really, really helpful for some and can be very frustrating for others. So it's okay if it's frustrating with you, for you, just bear with me um, because I have other things that might help you um, in the future. But for a lot of us, this is kind of the first way we learn bird songs. Um, and I'm gonna go back to our friendly neighborhood song sparrow that we've heard several times now. And there is actually a mnemonic for this bird. And it's often represented as maids, 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 put on your tea, kettle, edel, edel. And you'll see the maids, maids, maids are those first three notes that I was talking about before. And then the put on your tea, kettle, edel, edel represents kind of the jumble of things at the end. But it typically has a pattern like this. Um, See if you can kind of hear that in this bird song. His last one was a little bit different. It only said two maids, not three. Um, but I, hopefully you can hear that pattern in that song. And I have a couple of other examples. This is a much easier one to hear. This is an olive-sided flycatcher, um, an infrequent visitor to our area on um, migration, but I absolutely love its mnemonic. It's quick three beers, and this is its song. Now we know the bird isn't actually saying quick three beers. This is really just a phrase that helps us understand that song pattern. Um, so a couple of other examples for you. Um, this is an Eastern tohi that is often represented as drink your tea with the tea drawn out very long at the end. And the last example here that I have for you is the barred owl. And this is actually one of my other favorite mnemonics besides the olive-sided flycatcher. This one is, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And again, we know the birds aren't actually saying these things that we're putting to them, but it's really about recognizing the pattern. So if a mnemonic doesn't work for you, that's okay. Let it go. Um, I have this ongoing argument with my father about the song of the white-throated sparrow and the mnemonic that goes with it. So this is a white-throated sparrow. <laughs> I'm going to play you its song first. So this song is actually represented with two different mnemonics in a lot of places. One is Oh Sweet Canada, 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 or Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. My father insists that it is only Old Sam Peabody that works. And there is no possible way that Oh Sweet Canada, Canada, Canada could work for this bird song. Um, 
I personally can hear both and it kind of depends on which bird is singing. But I understand sometimes it doesn't work for people. But I think this is a really good example of showing what the mnemonic is actually representing. If you think about this, um, what this mnemonic is saying is that this bird sings two notes, O, oh, sweet, one is short, one is longer, and then it sings three repeated three syllable notes, Canada, 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 or Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. See if you can hear that now in this bird song, and you're listening for that pattern. Hopefully that you that pattern is making sense to you and you can kind of hear that in that song. But like I said, if a mnemonic doesn't work for you, that's okay, let it go. It is perfectly okay to make up your own mnemonics. Um, take phonetic notes on the bird songs that you're hearing, especially for birds you know. If you know that it's a cardinal that's singing or you know that it's a robin singing and you can sit there and watch it, Make up your own phonetic phrases that make sense to you because that is what is going to help you learn that bird song, remember it in the future, and then use those tools to identify birds that you don't know what they are when you hear them singing. Another thing that works is this idea of acoustic analogies. So um, the red-breasted nuthatch is often said to sound like a tiny tin horn. Whereas a field sparrow is often compared to, the song of a field sparrow is compared to a bouncing ping pong ball. So if mnemonics are something that you want to learn more about or learn what the mnemonics for different birds are, I encourage you to go to this website. I apologize, it's a long link. I, as I said, I'll send out a PDF that'll have the links in them, but you can just do a Google search for mnemonic bird songs. And this site will probably be the first or second um, site in the results that you get. This site literally has, I think it's a 27 page PDF if you printed it out, of, of mnemonics for bird songs. It has mnemonics for birds I didn't realize had a mnemonic for their song. So it really has a mnemonic for everything. So you can use that as a reference, um, things that you, you know, already kind of know, like if you know a Robin song or you know the Northern Cardinal or something like that, you can go and take a look and see what they're saying the mnemonic is and see if you can hear that for yourself. Um, and like I said, if you can't, don't worry about it, let it go. Um, I have an ongoing argument with somebody else here in the office who says there is no way that the bird is saying this, how could this possibly help you learn? But I think if you keep in mind that it is really about understanding the pattern of the bird song, and that's what these words are representing, I think it makes it easier to understand how to use mnemonics. And one last thing in this section um, before we go to questions is this idea of creating visual images. So this is a black and white warbler. It sings a high-pitched two-part song that's often compared to a squeaky wheel. Um, and it's often represented in words as wheezy, 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 or wheeza, wheeza, wheeza. So 
so that's great. We've got a couple of different ways of comparing this, of, of, of saying what this song is. It's a high pitched two part song. It sounds like a squeaky wheel. You know, we can represent it in words with wheezy, 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 which is kind of like a mnemonic, if you will. Um, but what if you take it one step further and you create a mental image in your head of the squeaky wheel being your bicycle and your bicycle is being stolen by a prisoner in a black and white striped suit that's running down the street. And I know that sounds really crazy, um, but the idea is to create a visual image in your head that links the bird song to the bird itself. So what it looks like. So here's another example, yellow warbler. Often represented in words, its song is sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. This is what the bird looks like. It's yellow. If we play the song. Whoa. So that we can actually take that mnemonic and use that to create an image in our head. So if we think about this, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Well, what makes something sweet? Honey, for example. A bird dripping in honey would be yellow. So we can make that connection to a yellow warbler. Now, I know this sounds strange. I'm going to be honest with you. This is not how I learn bird song. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of research that's been done recently that, and that talks about this idea of creating visual images and using them to connect concepts in our brain and that being a much stronger way of building memory, for example, and building connections within our brain. And so the idea is, and, and it's hard for me to explain this to you because really you need to create the visual image for yourself. So there's a link to an Audubon mag, uh, magazine article here about how to memorize bird songs using mental images. If this is something that sounds interesting to you, you want to explore a little bit, I really encourage you to go read the article and the tips that he has in there. He has some links to some of the other research that talks about this idea. Um, but the idea is really that you are building this image that connects the song to the bird's identification and not just this independent song file in your brain. And that will make it much stronger for you to remember in the future um, when you're out in the field. And so again, take a look at it. If it's something that you think might help you learn, um, this is just another tool in your toolbox. So I'm gonna stop here um, and take some time for questions before we get into the last section um, on learning tools and resources. Um, all right, so we have one question. Uh, back to the Blue Wing Warbler song. Mm -hmm. There was a quieter rising staccato between the latter calls, and is that the same bird? I think that was a prairie warbler. Yeah, I think there is a bird in the background there that it's a prairie warbler. I think you're right. Yeah, so it's like a buzzy ascending note, kind of. And there are no other questions because you're doing such a good job. <laughs> okay, so this last <laughs> section that I'm going to go into is all about learning tools and resources that you can take. Um, there is no one perfect solution and there is no right way to learn birdsong. We all learn a little bit differently and your choices are really going to depend on you, how you learn, how much time and effort you're willing to put into it and in some cases whether or not you want to spend any money and we'll talk a little bit about some of those options as well so a lot of times when people think about learning bird songs they say oh here's this cd with bird songs this will help me learn bird songs um, and this is really literally a monotonous list of bird names and a song so there is a narrator that says american robin it plays a song Eastern Bluebird plays the song. Remember when I said there's no right way to learn? There isn't, but this is the wrong way. <laughs> um, please don't start with these. And if you have, have them, put them on your shelf and go back to them. Um, they're good as a reference, 
and they can be really good to help you build short playlists of birds that you want to focus on but they're not a very good way of learning bird songs there's no connection to the birds themselves there's um no sort of foundational place to start if you will um, and so they're not the most helpful way to learn bird songs and honestly given the number of apps and digital field guides that have songs in them these things aren't as common as they used to be uh, but they are something that a lot of people have lying around or have gotten because they thought oh it would help me learn bird songs and then they find i've listened to the whole thing three times and i still don't know bird songs um, so don't start there, but keep them as a reference. And then regional guides can be really good um, for when you're traveling. And so that can be really helpful. As I said, there's probably digital references that are available now, but for some areas where there may not be as many online or digital things, like if you're going to some of the tropics and things like that, there may be um, CDs that could be more helpful. Um, for you if you're trying to learn songs before you go on a trip. This is what I've actually in the past highly recommended for a lot of beginners. This is kind of where I started and I think it laid a really good foundation for learning bird songs. It's not perfect um, and I'm going to go through a couple of the caveats with you right now. Um, First of all, you need to note that these CD series were published in the early 2000s. So mostly what are out there are used copies. So keep your eyes open for deals on used copies. I really, really wish that they would reissue this as a digital thing because it would be so much more helpful if they would. But the used copies are out there. You can find them. These, um, the, the birds are grouped by learning groups, essentially. So it puts a finite group of birds together, three, five, seven, maybe in some cases, you know, and it covers whistlers as a group or namesayers or the mimics. And so it really kind of concentrates your learning on a certain area, which is helpful because it makes you listen to birds that sound alike. And then you can start to hear the differences between their songs. Two recommendations that I really have for you for this, don't exclusively listen to this in your car. <laughs> I did that when I first started using this and it's great, but you're limited by your inability to make your own notes. And so when I say use the booklet, the booklet come, that comes with this has a space for you to be able to make your own notes about the songs that you're listening to, which can be really helpful because we all hear things a little bit differently. And so for you to write down things that, you know, are a little bit different from what the narrator is saying or something that gives you a handle on that bird song can be really helpful. And if you're only exclusively listening to it in your car, you can't do that. The other thing, the other limitation to this is one that I talked about earlier is that when you're listening to these CDs, you're not looking at a picture of the bird. So before I realized the importance of connecting the picture of the bird with the bird that was singing when I was trying to learn, I could tell you all 28 wood warbler songs that come through our area. I knew all their mnemonics. I didn't know what bird they went to, but I knew the whole list of mnemonics. So if you're going to listen to this, I encourage you to try to do it at home where you can have a field guide open and you can actually be looking at the bird that he's talking about while it's singing in your ear and that will really help you make that connection. The other really good thing about these, um, there are quizzes uh, based on habitat groupings at the end that can be really helpful to go through um, and practice your bird song identification. And it's one of the few things that has quizzes like that. So with those caveats in mind, I think this is a really good tool for people who are just getting started. Um, there are a number of apps that are available. So LarkWire is one. Um, this is really for home learning. This is not for in the field. Um, likewise, those CDs really aren't for in the field either. You can understand why um, since they're CDs. You're not likely to be carrying around a CD player with you. LarkWire can go on a phone, on a tablet, or on your laptop desktop computer. It does cost around $25, so it is a bit of an investment. This is um, 
a gamified kind of thing. So when you go in, you'll get this um, screen. You set the settings so you can start at a very beginner level, but and you can set it for the region that you're in specifically. You you will get this frame of four birds, and it will randomly play one of their songs. And you just click on the bird that's singing that you think is singing. And if you're right, it'll turn green and you'll get a point. And if it's wrong, you'll, it'll turn red and you won't get a point. And you'll keep going until you get all the points that are available essentially for that set of birds. You can see on the side here, there's a whole list of different bird categories that things are in. So you can just practice warblers or you can practice, uh, I can't even read these because it's so small, but there's a bunch of different ways that it, it organizes songs and you can kind of practice them and play with them at your leisure. Um, in addition, if you're just in the sort of informational mode, you can click on a bird and it'll flip over the card and it'll have a description of the bird song and then it'll have the examples of the songs that it has in the program so you can actually listen to them before you start playing if you will and it becomes a good resource i like this i think for me this took me to the next level after those beginning apps or the beginning cds that i had but not everybody learns this way and not everybody likes this. And I've had a couple of people who say that they didn't like it and it didn't really work for them. And again, that's okay. Um, there's no one way to do this. They do have a free, at least at last check, they have a free trial on their website. So you can use it on your home computer and see if it's something that you think you might like to explore, if it's worth spending the money to either put it on your computer or your tablet um, to be able to practice at home. So most field guides now that you can buy as apps or get as apps for your phone actually have almost all of them have songs and calls built in. There are free versions, there are paid versions. So this first icon here, this orange one with the egret, that's actually Audubon's field guide and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. The next one is Sibley. Um, and then the last one is a specific warblers guide. So if warblers are something that you're struggling with, you can get a digital version of this, put it on your phone, put it on your tablet, and be able to have the bird practice your warbler identification and songs at the same time. And as I said, these go from free to, I think the warblers and Sibley cost almost as much as the books do, um, if you were to buy the hard copy of the field guide, but you get the songs built in, so that's a bonus. That can be helpful in the field as well, because if you are thinking that this is what you're hearing, you can quietly, very quietly, so that you're not disturbing the bird, listen to those songs on your phone and be able to say, yes, that is indeed what I'm hearing, and put a name to the bird, um, just like you would with a field guide, a paper field guide, and a physical identification of a bird based on its eye rings or its wing bars or its color. Um, and so that can be really helpful. If you want the cheapest, easiest, quickest way, well, I shouldn't say quickest, but the cheapest and easiest way to learn bird songs is to download the free Audubon app and sit at home for 15 minutes a night and go through the Vireos and listen to the Vireos and read the descriptions and play the songs and do it again and only focus on those four or five birds for 15 minutes. Um, and then the next night, focus on maybe four or five warblers. And then, you know, continue to do that until you have a comfort level with some of these birds. Um, and that can be a relatively free and easy way um, to try to get some of these songs in your head. Just a fun thing, because um, it's free and it's a way of, of hearing some songs that you might not normally hear. There's a dawn chorus. I think that this is only available for the iPhone. Um, it's an alarm clock. It's got about 20 bird songs in it. You can select which songs you want to play and you can actually use it as an alarm clock and wake up to bird song. And you can pick different songs to wake up to every day. So you could learn um, the 20 birds that are in there um, just by hearing them every morning and recognizing what it is that's playing. Oh, that's the icon for what it looks like um, in the app store. So a few more things. Um, Merlin is a free app from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And again, it's a free thing. They have an 
Merlin is typically used in the field to identify birds based on their physical characteristics and what they're doing. So if they're standing in the water or if they're up in the top of a tree, um, if they're small, if they're big, if they're blue or they're green or whatever, there's a whole list of questions it takes you through and then it gives you a list of possible identifications based on your physical location and the time of year that you're in. Um, it can be a great tool if you're also a beginning birder learning how to just identify birds in general. But each bird that comes up also has a song. So you can use it to try to identify songs um, that you're singing. And again, if you're using this in the field, you want to be playing it very quietly so that you're not disturbing the birds with it. Uh, remember those birds are singing because they're trying to create a territory. And if you're playing that bird song on your phone, then that bird is now going to expend energy trying to defend its territory against you. Um, and we want to try to minimize the stress on the birds. So play it very quietly, play it with headphones in, whatever it takes to help you um, make that connection to the birds. But again, another free app, eBird on the computer version, not on the mobile version, but on the um, computer version, there is actually under the exploration section of eBird, there you can actually go do a photo sound quiz. Um, it's fun and I like it. The problem, the one downside caveat to it is that it requires you to make a rating of each song file or each um, photo that you look at in as you're doing the quiz. And they're trying to make their um, artificial intelligence better behind the scenes. So they're forcing that rating of things. Um, hopefully over time, that might go away a little bit because it's actually really annoying to hear a sound and pick what bird it is and then have to rate the quality of that every single time when you're trying to do a quiz. But it's free, it can be a good tool um, to help learn bird songs. And then these last two are <laughs> the ones that everybody asks me about all the time, you know, isn't there an app that can help me identify bird song in the field? Well, yes, but. And it's a couple of big butts. There's actually two. Neither one of them are free. I think they're four or five dollars. Um, they're touchy. The idea is good. Um, so they're kind of like Merlin. It's that we're in the field. I'm hearing a bird singing. I want to identify it right away. What is it? What's singing? <laughs> The problem is, is that in order to do that, you actually have to record the bird you hear singing. And so you can do that. And actually iPhones and, and, and Android phones these days can actually make pretty good sound recordings. But there's a lot of caveats. If there's a lot of background noise, if there's wind, if there's a lot of other birds singing in the area, it can be really difficult to get a clean recording to put into the app to then help you identify it. Um, literally, I sat in my driveway. I, I had the robin. It was hanging on a tree branch right in front of my head, and I was recording it, and I could not get, I think it was bird sleuth, song sleuth, to identify that it was a robin. Other songs I've had no problem with, so it, it varies. Um, Again, it's a matter of do you want to invest the money in them? They're not outrageously expensive, but they are, they're not perfect. And they're, they're not going to help you in the time that you need it the most, even though that's what they're designed to do, I'm afraid to say. And so give it a try, play around with it. Um, just know that they're very touchy and, and, and very particular. Another thing that, um, two things that you need to keep in mind with both of these apps is that you can very rapidly take up memory space on your phone recording bird song singing. So you're gonna wanna go through and erase those songs at some point because they're just gonna be taking up memory um, on your phone. And then the other thing is, is that using them can be a battery suck on your, on your phone when you're out in the field. So, um, I, you know, again, give it a try. They are out there. I think over time they might get better, but this is really a limitation of the technology and the way that it works. And, you know, that's what we have these days. Um, I personally think that you would be better to sit at home with the CDs ahead of time 
or a field guide and learn and practice and and then be able to go out and put those things into practice in the field rather than worrying about trying to get a perfect recording in the field. Um, but sometimes they might be helpful. So again, um, if you're willing to spend five bucks, you know, give it a try. You probably don't need both of them. Um, try one. They're both kind of as touchy as the other. So I can't really recommend one over the other at this point. Um, there are some books and websites as well. If this is, you know, appealing to you and you want to do a little bit more digging. Um, these first three books, The Singing Life of Bird, Listening to a Continent Sing, and Backyard Bird Song are all by Donald Kruzma. He does a lot of stuff with bird song. Um, I think he actually has a new bird, new book that's coming out shortly um, as well about bird songs. Kind of the next level. The Singing Life of Birds is a good book um, that just talks about understanding bird song. He goes through several examples. It's not really a learning bird song, but you will learn some bird songs because he uses them as an example. But he talks about why birds sing, how they sing, um, those kinds of things. Listening to a Continent Sing is actually really a, a novel that that's not a novel. It's a nonfiction book that he wrote um, traveling across the country and he recorded all the birds that he was singing and throughout the book are scattered QR codes. So you can use your phone and the QR code reader on your phone and actually highlight over that QR code and listen to the bird that he's talking about in the text. It's a little clunky to do, um, but it's kind of fun. Um, I can't do more than about a chapter at a time because it just gets annoying going back and forth between the phone and the book. But again, it's kind of a fun concept if you sort of want to immerse yourself in a little bit of bird songs. Um, this backyard bird song guide, some of us may look at these and think, oh, they're kind of silly and funny and they're just a gimmick. And they're not, actually. They can be really helpful. And again, it's because the idea of um, you open a page and there's a picture of the bird, like the scarlet tanager that's on the cover, and it'll have a code. And you type the code in um, to the, the thing on the side here, and it'll play the bird song for you. So you're looking at the, the bird and you're hearing the song. So again, it's that connection of, of the, the visual and the auditory. Um, and then this last book is um, a relatively new one, the Peterson Field Guide to Bird Sounds. Um, this one is of Eastern North America. He has since released Western North America as well. Um, this is based on a concept that uses spectrograms to actually visualize bird song. I could do a whole nother webinar on this book alone because anytime I've tried to incorporate it into a beginning bird song, people just are like, whoa, that's way too over the top for me. Um, I don't need that right now. And the idea is actually, again, it comes back to visualization. In this case, you're actually visualizing the song, kind of like musical notes on a, a sheet music um, score. And it can be helpful for some people. It can be really confusing for others. So um, there is a website that goes along with that that has kind of the basics of what he's talking about. Again, things to check out. And then these last two websites here, um, Zeno Canto and All About Birds. Um, this, the Zeno Canto is literally a database of bird songs. So if you want to go on there and you can upload your bird songs uh, into the database as well. And so, you know, if you want to go hear the 100 different song sparrows sing and the variation in song sparrows, across the country, this is your website. Um, again, it can be used just as a useful reference to um, compare a song that you're hearing. Um, you know, it's free, it's all there, and there's lots of different variations of songs that people have uploaded. All About Birds is just another bird identification site that's free. Um, it talks about, literally is kind of a species account, slightly more expanded over what a field guide might have. So it talks about nesting characteristics and what the eggs look like. And then there's also a song clip there as well. So that can be another really good resource. And then just to wrap up here before I break for questions for the last time. So when we're out and listening to bird song, um, obviously that's one S, but don't forget about the other three S's. And, and we always need to keep in mind when we're talking about birds, where are we? So the site, what season are we in? And what situation are we in? Because that's gonna really impact um, the options that we have in some cases. So, you know, these first three weeks of May, our options are wide open. But we get to the first week of August 
and our options are much more limited in terms of what might be singing in this area um, in a particular habitat. So again, always something good to keep in mind when we're talking about bird song and any kind of bird identification. The biggest tip that I can give you, and I kind of alluded this to this earlier, is limit your sessions with the learning tools. Don't sit down and say, well, I'm gonna give myself two hours and I'm gonna learn all the warblers. Don't do it. You will exhaust your brain and you will not remember what you were doing. Limit it to like 15 minutes at a time. Do a little bit every day and you'll go a lot further than you know giving yourself this giant big chunk of time um, to try to work with because we'll, we just oversaturate our brain and it just won't stick. And again, start small. Think about the local singers that you hear and learn those songs. Learn the ones that are in your backyard um, and then learn their call notes. Because if you start to learn call notes of the birds that you know, then you can start to filter them out in the field so that you know in the winter when you're hearing other call notes from new birds who aren't actively singing that you, know, you have a better sense of what's going on um, and what birds might be out there. And then expand into the migrants slowly. Um, and again, focusing on their songs first and call notes second, third, or fourth. Um, you know, really focus on the songs um, to get you started um, because that's gonna help you um, learn the best. And the best learning will always be in the field with the birds. And for those of you who are not early risers, truly the best time to hear birds sing is early in the morning, I'm sorry to say. Um, but if you really wanna get out there and learn, that's when you need to do it. And you also need to think about coming back to the seasonality of things. You know, if you really wanna practice on your warblers, then you need to be ready to spend some time out in the field during these first several weeks of May when the vast majority and the largest um, diversity of warblers is in the area because once they move further north, we won't hear them again till next year. And so um, if that's something that you want to learn, then that's you need to, you know, plan your weekend times or days off or whatever um, in early May around that to get out in the field and learn. And don't worry if you can't ID at all. Uh, making mistakes is absolutely part of the learning process and, and making a mistake and or not knowing what you heard, taking notes on it and not being able to identify it moving forward is is how we learn and we learn what to listen for the next time or what to look for if we're doing a physical identification. Um, I've put together, this was actually a really hard list, um, but I know sometimes people are like, well, where do I start? So I tried, I really tried to make this the top 10 birds to learn. So if you really want to learn 10 birds, focus on the first column, um, but 20 birds seemed like another nice round number that was doable. Probably a lot of these songs you already know. Um, you're probably familiar with a lot of them, even if you don't necessarily know what's making that noise right now. So focus on these birds first. Um, don't, as I said, I'm gonna send the PDF around so you don't have to like scramble to write all these down. It'll be in the PDF, but this kind of gives you a foundation for a lot of the common birds in our area. And if you get a really good handle on these, it will help you, one, sort them out when you hear something different in the field, okay? The other thing is it can help you form a foundation for other birds. So if we take the American Robin, for example, there's three other birds that can be in our area that, roughly in our area, um, that can sound like a robin and have a similar sort of song to a robin. Um, the rose-breasted grosbeak, the summer tanager and the scarlet tanager. And if you learn the American robin and you know it really well, then when you're out in the field, you can help, that can help you learn to separate out those other songs as well. And a lot of times you'll think, wait, that sounds like a robin, but it's not quite right. And then you can put it in your head, wait, maybe it's one of those other three songs. And learning the robin can help you learn the differences uh, between those other songs as well. So. Focusing on the basics can really help you um, just find, find a foundation um, for that. So I'm done talking. I'm happy to answer some questions for people um, if there are any. And feel I'm gonna put my um, contact information up there. 
Um, feel free to reach out with a question if something occurs to you um, after the fact. Feel free to reach out um, with an email and you know I'll do whatever I can do to answer it. Uh, we will put the recording up in the next few days as well so you'll have that as a reference and I will send out an email with um, a PDF of the actual slides. Awesome. Uh, I don't think we have any questions. A couple people noted that they use BirdNet, which is an app for Android, and they okay. like that, and it has a percent um, confidence level of the match. And I'd never heard of that, so that sounds like it could be kind of interesting to check out. Yeah, I have to check that out and put it on the put it on my slides so that I have it for the future. But that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you can see the chat box now, Christy, but a lot of people are saying, thank you, this was excellent. <laughs> Got it. I can now. Nice. Yeah, that was really good. Great. Well, I'm I'm, I appreciate yeah. everybody for stopping by and, and doing this. I hope that you take some things away um, and some tools that you can use to learn. Um, and like I said, please feel free to reach out if any questions occur to you after the fact. I'll be happy to try and answer them as best I can.